Okay. Here we're going to talk about avalanche terrain identification for skiing and snowboarding. At this point, you guys are all familiar with the avalanche triangle. We're going to focus on the terrain element. So avalanche terrain is a nice, simple item that we can choose to change as far as our exposure to. Some basic path terminology. So we have our start zone, our track, and our runout. Our start zone is where avalanches often start. Our track is really the meat of the avalanche path. And the runout is where the avalanche debris in a large avalanche ends up. So it's nice and simple in this photo here, big avalanche path, very clearly defined, but we're not always in terrain like that. So as we're traveling through terrain, it looks more like this. There are multiple starting zones, multiple tracks, multiple runout zones. So we have to constantly be reassessing and have good situational awareness as to what we're exposing ourselves to. If we wanna make it more black and white, we really only wanna expose one person at a time to an avalanche hazard. Now that's not always realistic. So we just need to have good situational awareness, and understand the consequences of exposing more than one person to a path at a time. So regrouping areas, you know, we don't always get to pick the best spot to regroup, but if we do, we want to select them to be out of an avalanche path, not exposed to any overhead hazard. So you can see this little bump here at the bottom of the photo, that's a great place to regroup. If you're regrouping on the ridge line, that's also a great spot, but you do need to be aware of cornices and we'll get into that later. So some terrain basics we're gonna go over. We're gonna talk about slope angle, slope size, vegetation, slope shape, aspect, elevation and consequences. So slope angle, most avalanches occur between 30 and 45 degrees. Anything below that is usually not steep enough to slide. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it's just not as common. And over 45 degrees, the snow doesn't stay as long. It's constantly sloughing off. And so the slabs aren't as commonly formed up there. So it's not always about what slope you're standing on, the slope angle, but you have to think about what you're also connected to. So am I down in the flats and exposing myself to the hazards above? Am I adjacent to these paths? Think about it as you travel through avalanche terrain. You don't always have to be in the start zone to be in an avalanche path. So some basic ways to measure slope angle, there are inclinometers, which are these little slope angle measuring tools, super handy. You can also use your phone to get that slope angle. Very basic tools, highly recommend them. And then there, are, you can also use maps or mapping apps, but it's important to understand the limitations of maps and mapping apps. They're great planning tools, but not always great in the moment. Avalanche size. So avalanches come in all shapes and sizes. They can be small tempered slopes, giant mountain faces, or just large paths, or they could be road cuts or little gullies. And you can increase the size of an avalanche either by increasing the width of them or the depth of the snow that is involved in the avalanche. So it doesn't have to be a giant slope to have a large volume of snow if the snowpack is deep. And what we're most concerned about are avalanches that are big enough to hurt, bury, or kill us. And we as humans aren't that big, so it really doesn't take that large of an avalanche to increase the consequences of a negative outcome. Other things that can increase negative outcomes or the consequences are what's called terrain traps. So you can have significantly um, abrupt transitions, like a road cut to a road, or a slope to a flatter zone. 
you're going to have an increased deposition of snow. Trees also filter snow differently than an open slope and also present a trauma element as well as cliffs. So large paths, gullies, sharp transitions, trees and cliffs, those are all going to increase the consequences if you're caught in an avalanche there. So forested terrain is not something you should let your guard down in. If you can travel through the forested terrain, that means those trees are not anchoring that snow to that slope. So be aware that you're still in avalanche terrain when you're in timbered slopes. As you're traveling around, you can also look at trees for any flagging. And flagging is just limbs that have been broken off a side of the tree as avalanches have come through and snapped them off, as you can see in the photo there. Slope shape. So you have convexities and concavities. Convexities create stress as the slab is bent over that roll. And it can create a very common starting zone for an avalanche. Contrastly, you have concavities, which create a terrain trap where snow, if as it's traveling down the slope, can have an increased deposition in those concavities, so a deeper burial. Photo here, you know, you can see the starting zone of that avalanche up there on the rollover convexity as it travels down and gets terminated there in the terrain trap gully. So you're gonna have a deeper burial there. And you can see how deep it is by looking at the two small people on that debris. So aspect as it relates to wind. We all like playing in the mountains and wind is a big part of that. So you have your windward slopes, which is where the wind is coming from. And those slopes are often scoured or have a shallower snowpack. And then you have your leeward slopes, which is where all that snow from the windward side was deposited. And so your snowpack is deeper. You can also have on a ridge line cornices. And cornices are these wave like formation on the ridge tops that are super sensitive and can break very far back. So if you're regrouping on a ridge top, you really need to be far away from that edge because those cornices can pull snow way far back towards the other side. Below cornices, you have what's called a pillow. And a pillow is just a wind deposited slab that's super sensitive right below the cornice. So a very sensitive trigger point for an avalanche. And as you travel through this terrain, you should always be curious and paying attention to where has the snow been transported? If I'm standing on a very scoured or thin snowpack, where did this snow go? And you can see in this photo, it's, it's really easy to identify here what way the wind is blowing because you have slopes that are completely scoured and all of that snow was deposited on the leeward side. So always be aware and pay attention to when you see scoured slopes. Obviously, there was a presence of wind. Now, aspect as it relates to the sun, you have your shadier aspects, which are more northerly, and those are often cooler, have softer snow, and can have more persistent instabilities due to the longer snow cover throughout the year. And then you have your sunny aspects, which are your more southerly aspects, and those are warmer, have more crusts, shallower, and often prone to wet, loose avalanches. And if we were to take that to the real world here, you have a southerly slope on a warming day, and you can see all these little point release avalanches in warming snow or becoming wet snow. So this is something as you travel to have good situational awareness of and be like, oh, I see that that is a southerly slope, it is warming, and we're already seeing point release avalanches in this small avalanche terrain here. Elevation. So avalanches can occur at all elevations. Higher elevations are often colder, snowier, and windier, but that doesn't mean that avalanches can't occur below those higher elevations. 
And again, we talked about the forest to terrain presenting its own significant consequences if caught in them. So have your hackles up in all slopes, regardless of elevation, but it is something to pay attention to as you travel up and down the elevation spectrum. So it's really easy to have uh, and assess avalanche terrain when you have the whole picture. Like looking at this photo here, we can see the huge giant path, the start zone, the track, and the run out. And we can come up with all sorts of plans of how we want to mitigate our exposure. But it really does look differently when you're on the slope like this. So you need to constantly be thinking about whether or not the terrain you're in is capable of producing an avalanche and what are the consequences of an avalanche if one occurs here. Large avalanches are less common, but that doesn't mean they're not possible. And contrastly, small avalanches are more common and it doesn't mean we should downplay them because again, we're just human and we're not that big and we don't want to be buried. So constantly be asking yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen where I'm at and where I plan to travel to? So as we put it all together, it's important to realize that patterns exist in the snowpack based on the slope angle, the aspect, and the elevation. And that directly should impact how we manage our day and keep our situational awareness up as we travel through avalanche terrain and make those decisions on our travel plans. And so through this, we can hopefully be able to clearly identify avalanche terrain, even in complex situations where it's not just one path. You want to be able to manage your exposure in that path or paths and you want to minimize the time spent in, adjacent, or below avalanche paths. And again, constantly be asking yourself, is this terrain capable of producing an avalanche? What are the consequences of an avalanche if one occurs here, large or small? And what can we do to mitigate our exposure to this hazard, whether that's taking shallow or slope angles that aren't exposed to overhead hazards, or just changing our plans throughout the day? But again, it's a constant cycle of situational awareness and with a very simple answer of managing our avalanche terrain exposure. We really recommend that you sign up for the daily forecast emails. So there's a QR code there. And again, thanks for paying attention.